Well, good morning. So, you know, Kira just asked a really good question to lift up to God in prayer, but I want you to keep thinking about it as we talk together for a few moments. Is there anything in your life that you brought with you into this place today? Or for those of you who are at home, uh, right where you are now, is there anything in your life that you would identify as a worry? Did you bring something with you today that you're worried about? You know, the list could be long. You could be worried about the war in Ukraine. You could be worried about the price of gas. You could be worried about a doctor's appointment that you just had this past week, or you could be worried about the appointment that you just scheduled. You could be worried about a child or a grandchild. And just as likely, children can worry about their parents at all stages of life. Over the past two years, I think we've all had a new level of experience with worry. In fact, Marnie and I were talking uh, earlier this week, just kind of remembering that uh, this weekend marks exactly two years since our first entirely virtual worship service in 2020, two years ago this weekend. And the opportunities for worry since then, well, they, they just keep coming, don't they? Whatever it is that might be on your mind today as something you would name in your life as a worry, Jesus asks a question. And the question is simply this, why? Why do you worry? That question is not meant in any way to minimize or dismiss or take away from the importance of what it is you might be worried about. You know, the truth is we, we worry about things sometimes because they really do matter to us. They're important. And Jesus doesn't address our worries by trying to Take whatever it is that burdens you today and make it smaller. He doesn't do that. But the question is a reminder to us that we were never meant to live tense and anxious lives. God never intended that for us. So years ago, I came across this quote from Max Lucado. It's in a book called Just Like Jesus. And I want to share it with you, get you to listen to the way he uh, invites us to think about this. Here's what he says. What if for one day Jesus were to become you? What if for 24 hours Jesus wakes up in your bed, walks in your shoes, lives in your house, assumes your schedule? With one exception, nothing about your life changes. Your health doesn't change, your circumstances don't change, your schedule is not altered, your problems are not solved. Only one change occurs. What if for one day and one night, Jesus lives your life with his heart? What would you be like? Would people notice a change? Your family, would they see something new? Your coworkers, would they sense a difference? And what about you? How would you feel? What alterations would this transplant have on your stress level? What would it do to your temper? Would you sleep better? Would you still dread what you are dreading? Better yet, would you still do what you are doing? With Jesus taking over your heart, would anything change? I know one thing that would change for me, 
is simply that I would worry less. That's definitely one change that would happen. I would worry less. Probably the most frequent confession that I have to make is around worry. And that sermon series that we just wrapped up two weeks ago about spiritual warfare, the good fight, that fight for me is so often fought in the arena of worry. That's a spiritual battle that I've engaged far more than I should. Again, the question that we're looking at today is not spoken as an accusation. It's not really even meant to be a rebuke. But why do you worry? I hope you will hear in this question that Jesus asks. It's an invitation. Jesus is inviting you to a worry-free life. He's inviting you to the life as you and I were meant to live it in fellowship with a God who loves us, who made you, who cares for you. And I want you to hear exactly how Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 6. If you've got a Bible or a device that you want to look at, that's great. Or you can follow along on the screen. We're going to begin Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. And for some of you, these will be uh, very familiar words. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Many translations use the word worry. Do not worry about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Have you ever told anybody, don't worry? Has anybody ever told you, don't worry? And did it work? I want to suggest today, really, all of us know this, no one has ever stopped worrying because somebody sincerely said, don't worry. At least for me, nobody has ever said to me, don't worry. To which I responded, oh, okay. (laughs) No one's ever just sort of stopped worrying because someone told them to. But Jesus is inviting us in this text into a life free of worry. And over and over again, he says, do not worry. Do not be anxious. In fact, the word that's the, the, the same word in the original language of the New Testament, 
the word for worry, it shows up in the passage that I just read to you about six times. I want to take a moment and I want to look at exactly what Jesus said about worry. And then I want to see how we can actually enter into it. Let's look at these three things that Jesus said. It's it's actually such a rich and wonderful text. There's a lot more to talk about, but I'm just lifting out a few, okay? Uh, The very typical preacher three, all right? But here's what we see in this passage. Number one, our worry is misplaced. Secondly, Jesus tells us that our worry is unproductive. And thirdly, he makes it clear that when we worry, it places limitations on God. Worry is misplaced, it is unproductive, and it limits God. Now I want to look at the scripture to see where we get each of those. First of all, worry is misplaced. Jesus says, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? The aim of your life was never meant to be simply staying alive. The aim and energy of your life cannot simply be the next meal or how you look. Life is more than that. There are things of greater significance. There's something more than simply the, these, these basic necessities. And Jesus is telling us that when we worry about those things, that, it, that our worry is misplaced because life is more than that. It's more than food. It's more than your clothes. It's more than the house you live in. Secondly, Jesus tells us that our worry is unproductive. Look at this. Which of you, by being worried or anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? The old King James Version uses that unit of measurement with regard to height. And and the word can be understood either way. It can be a measurement of time. Or it can be a measurement of stature. The King James Version said, Who of you by being anxious can add a cubit to his height? But it doesn't really matter because the point is the same. And you and I both know this. Worry will not make a difference to either of those things. You're not going to make yourself taller by worrying. And you're not going to lengthen your days by worrying. In fact, you may cut them short a little bit, right? It is unproductive. It is not fruitful. You're not going to add a moment to your life or an inch to your height. It just doesn't do anything. And probably most significantly, last of all, it really is a limitation on God. It limits God. Because Jesus makes it clear that when we're the kinds of things that we tend to worry about, these are things that, that people who really do not know God, God is just not a factor in their life. They live their days seeking these things. The ESV uses the word Gentile. The NIV uses the word pagans. But it's just a way of referring to people who who do not live in fellowship with God. They chase after these things and then look at what Jesus adds. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. When you and I worry, we really place a limit on God as if he doesn't know or he, he doesn't care. There's a a wonderful verse out of the little New Testament letter of 1 Peter, chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. It says, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. 
in those two little verses, there's a connection between humbling and casting my cares. It really says that when I, when I refuse to cast my cares on him, when I insist on worry, worry is a form of pride. It really is. Worry is an expression of pride. It is the original and the foremost sin. The root of all sins is human pride. And worry is an expression of that. It's a way of living that says, my life is my project. (laughs) And it all depends on me. And it limits God. God is small. He is not able. And even if he's able, he doesn't seem interested. But that's not what Jesus says. Your heavenly father knows exactly what you need. He knows exactly what concerns you. So yes, Jesus is clear. Our worries are often misplaced. They're unproductive. And they limit God. Those things are clearly in the text of Scripture. I know them, and I believe them. And guess what? I worry anyway. I know these things, I believe these things, and I still worry. Let me give you just a little example of how it works for me. This is a picture of our driveway in the home we lived in in Georgia. Now, first of all, I, I, well, let me be totally honest. I chose this one because it's the only one I have on my phone, okay? But I thought it was interesting. What, what do you notice on the ground? Yes, every now and then in Atlanta, Georgia, we, you can get snow. And our driveway was the driveway of choice for every kid in the neighborhood. As you can tell, and that's Marnie in the driveway, uh, by the way, but our driveway was long and steep. And on those rare occasions when the snow fell, every kid in the neighborhood wanted to come and slide down our driveway. In fact, you can see some tracks, I believe, right down the middle. Now, I show you my driveway, though, to tell you another story about when we were getting ready to move to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania a few years ago. I lost sleep in the wee hours of the morning thinking, how will a moving truck get our stuff down that driveway Onto a truck and up to Pennsylvania. I did. I'm not, I'm not trying to be amusing, folks. I did. I laid awake thinking about that. Now, you might be hearing me, and you're thinking, well, that was dumb. <laughs> and you know what? You're right. <laughs> it was dumb. It was a dumb reason to lose sleep. First of all, it was misguided. (laughs) Of all the things that you can direct mental and emotional energy to, is a moving truck in a driveway worth that? I mean, it's misguided. Life is more. Folks, life is more than your driveway. It was unproductive. (laughs) Because there was nothing going on in my mind that was actually going to move furniture down the hill onto a truck. It's totally unproductive. And by the way, the people who do this professionally, they already had it figured out. I was laying awake thinking about it, and someone else already knew the answer. It was unproductive. It did not add a stature, a, a minute to my life. In fact, took away sleep time. I don't know, you, you, you ever had evenings like that? Ever had nights like that? And then finally, you know, it really does limit God. You know, if, if God wants you to be somewhere, 
He'll make a way. He'll make a way for you to get there. God wasn't the least bit concerned about my driveway. Misguided, unproductive, small God. So I know that none of us have ever stopped worrying just because someone said, don't worry. And by the way, let me make it perfectly clear. My message to you today, I'm not up here to tell you how I kicked my worry habit. But I do want to point out to you in this passage of Scripture one word that I, th- I find really helpful. And this is something I can do. When someone says to me, hey, don't worry, I, I, I'm just not able, I don't know how to do that. But here's something we can do. Jesus uses two illustrations. Imagine him teaching outdoors. This is the Sermon on the Mount. He's on a hillside. And he's talking about, he's talking to people about worry. And I think just in that moment, he was able to illustrate. And he points and says, look at the birds. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow and they don't reap. They're busy, but they're not driven. They're not worried. And God takes care of them. God feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Now notice the train of argument. It is from lesser to greater. If God does this, he will surely do this. And then Jesus uses a different word image, the lilies of the field. Consider the the lilies of the field. They don't toil, they don't spin, they don't worry about manufacturing. But not even Solomon was dressed like these lilies. And if God clothes them, he will surely do this for you from lesser to greater. Now here's the word I want you to notice. And I really just, it wasn't long ago that I first came across this. When Jesus talks about birds, he simply says, look. Look at the birds. But when he comes to the lilies, he uses a different word. And in the language, the original language of the Bible, it is a different word. He uses the word consider. Consider the lilies. That's a different word. It carries a different meaning. Consider. This word means to examine carefully, to learn from, and to grasp. Ponder. Don't just look at them. It's not a a mere observation, but it is a dwelling on to, to examine carefully. And I would say it doesn't really matter if it's birds of the air or lilies of the field. Anything that allows you to direct your mind to the goodness and the power and the care of God. Okay, I can, I can work on that. I can do that. Dallas Willard says it this way. He said that if, if, anyone, is, if anyone is to love God and to have their life filled with that love, God in his glorious reality must be brought before the mind and kept there. Hear that, folks. God must be brought before the mind and kept there in such a way that the mind takes root and stays fixed there. See, the question becomes for us, what do you dwell on? And we're always dwelling on something. What do you dwell on? Where does your mind Stay fixed. It reminds me of this uh, wonderful little verse out of Isaiah. In fact, I would encourage you this week, uh, jot it down, Isaiah 26.3. Memorize it. Go home and look it up. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. I love that phrase. Whose mind is stayed. 
Where is your mind stayed? What do you dwell on? What do you consider? You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Consider. Examine carefully. Learn. Anything that directs your mind to the goodness and the power and the care of God. Paul would say the same thing in Philippians. <laughs> whatever's good, whatever is true, whatever's beautiful, whatever is worthy, he's got a long list. And then he gets to the end and he just says, Think on these things. And the peace of God, the peace of God will be yours. So I would, I would end like this. Here's what, I can't just stop worrying, but I can do this, and you can too. Direct your mind to the truth that you know. And direct your mind to the story that you have lived. The, the truth we know is always found right here. And all of you probably, so many of you know enough, you, you probably know the opening line of Psalm 23. That's, the Lord is my shepherd, what? I shall not want. Direct your mind. I shall not be in want. I shall not live with a nagging anxiety. I shall not want. Direct your mind to the truth that you know and direct your mind to the story that you've lived because in some way, at some time, you have probably seen the goodness and the care of God. You've lived it. And as we do that, maybe what Max Lucado wrote about, that, that begins to happen. We begin to live our life with his heart. And the things that worry you, they may not change. But you know what changes? Me. And God does that by his grace. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful that you invite us to live a worry-free life and we acknowledge that we can't change our habits of worry simply by being told to change them, God. Something else needs to happen within us and it needs to happen within our heart and only you can do that. And so as we direct our mind to the truth that we know and as we direct our mind to the story that we've lived, God, would you be at work to change our hearts so that we can live our days at rest, confident in the care of God. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.